It was the most private of times for the most public of people. Michael Jackson's family and closest friends had come together at Forest Lawn Cemetery to bid him a final farewell. To prepare Jackson, his family had turned to the three people who'd been dressing him and making him up for more than a quarter century, Dennis Tompkins, Michael Bush, and Karen Fay. Karen, the family called you and asked you to make Michael Jackson up. Yeah. Nobody else could have. How did you do it? It's an honor to do it. It's an honor to do it. I knew how I wanted to look. So I did. First family, first children. And you all dressed him. Yeah, the family called and said, you've worked with Michael for so many years, we need you to do his outfit. And he going like, okay, if he ever needed me, he needs me now. So what did you pick? Well, the only thing I can say at this point, because the family wanted his to, most wants to keep it private. There's elements of everything that was his favorite looks over the years. Everything was new. Were you proud of it? Yes. Yeah, very, yeah. very, very. It was beautiful. There had to have been a glove. Mm -mm. No. no. He didn't want that. Well, see, the, the, Michael, the glove was Billie Jean. That represented that song. That wasn't... Not himself. That's not Michael Jackson. That's the song. That's my performance. That's Billie Jean. Do you want to put, put the on the jacket? jacket? <laughs> and these were people who knew the man behind the music. Michael Bush, you're going to like this. This is you working. Knew him stripped of the artifice he so cleverly showed the world. Unguarded moments captured by Karen Fay. I'm not lit properly. This isn't fair. Oh, that's right. Where's the bounce car? <laughs> ABC News paid to license footage song? and photos from his three friends' private collections. His inner circle was determined Jackson would exit as the world had known him, as a showman. The work that me and Karen did with Michael <clears throat> at Forest Lawn, I think, bonded us for life. Nine hours, wasn't it? Nine hours. Nine, Nine hours. hours. You didn't know you'd be the actual person to dress him no. all last time. I never expected, even when we did the costume, to do that. I thought, you know, hand it through a door, I'm, I'm done. And then I assisted you. And I think the hardest thing is, I mean, they, they asked me to help. Everyone's gone. We, we have to get him in the coffin. So I had to help pick him up and place him in the coffin. And to me, it's like, well, I got to do this for my best friend. The final touch, Tompkins designed this crown to bid the king of pop farewell. May I pick it up? Yes. It looks like ermine down here. It's, it's not real, is faux. it? No. Faux ermine. It's a show crown. <laughs> show crown. <laughs> For perhaps the greatest showman of them all. You can't help but think he would have loved seeing his children proudly carry that crown. When the casket was brought in at Forest Lawn into the service, Prince and Paris and Blanket lifted and put it on the center of the flowers on the coffin. Well, that must have been a moment. It definitely. Yeah. This is the first time Topkins, Fay, and Bush have talked about their employer and friend. So, Karen, tell me about the first time you met him. Um, I met him in the summer of 1982. Just a little bit softer. She'd been called in to do his hair and makeup for the cover of Thriller, which would become the biggest selling album of all time. And he'd brought along a surprise, a baby tiger. I was more fascinated with that tiger than I was with him. So I think he really enjoyed that my attention wasn't totally focused on him. In fact, a little known fact, you flashed him that first day. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> I undid the top of my jeans, and I just flashed him the top. Because I happened to have worn some tiger underwear that day. And he went, ah! And he, just, he, he was just so embarrassed by that. I quickly buttoned it up. But I think that's why he called me back the next job. You think? I think so. <laughs> he liked people who had a sense of humor. Yes, absolutely. He also liked people who had a sense of style. For more than two decades, the majority of Jackson's most memorable outfits came out of the workshop run by Dennis Tompkins. If you had to sum up his style, what was it? Liberace has gone to war. <laughs> Liberace has <laughs> gone to war. Liberace there you go. And I said that's pretty good. <laughs> His genius as an artist is unquestioned, but we wanted to know about the persistent rumors that followed him. There's been a lot of talk about whether or not he was abusing drugs. Nobody was in a more intimate position than the three of you to, to know. 
kind of popular wisdom was that after the Pepsi commercial, uh -huh. where his hair caught on fire, and he had to take painkillers. That that's point. not true. That's not true. That's not true because that's not where um, <clears throat> it initially started. Faye insists Jackson's use of prescription drugs began in 1993, nine years after the Pepsi commercial. Just before we went on tour for Dangerous, he had an operation in order to help the scarring. But he didn't have enough time to heal. We were getting on a plane and going right to Bangkok. So in order to keep going, he started using some painkillers because it was very painful when the nerve endings are severed. Do you know what he was taking? Oh, no. No, I don't. It wasn't out in the open. It wasn't. No, 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 no. no. But it was while they were in Bangkok, Jackson's world exploded. Police sources say the charges involve a 13-year-old boy. Amidst reports that California authorities were investigating him for sexually abusing a 13-year-old boy. So now we're talking a physical pain, and now we're talking emotional pain. The day that, that came out, he was stepping on stage in front of like 80,000 people. Jackson went through with the performance, but the price was high. It was devastating because he had to go out every day in front of a world and the media who was telling Crushing everybody it, that, that he, would, he was a pedophile, but he still went out and had to face everybody. Aided, Faye says, by painkillers. It gave him some sort of ability to get through it. But even then, Jackson couldn't sleep, say Bush and Faye. And the combined toll of the allegations and touring was showing, at least backstage. You have to understand his adrenaline was so intense. Sometimes it would take him mm -hmm. two days. Two days to go to sleep. For his adrenaline just to come down fr from one show. In 1994, Jackson settled out of court with his accuser. But nearly a decade later, yet another boy came forward also alleging sexual abuse. The most loving thing to do is to share your bed with someone. That remark from a British documentary was so incendiary, it fueled Jackson's prosecution. When you say the word bed, a lot of people think sexual, and that was the farthest thing from Michael's mind. I mean, we would go do an awards show, you come back, everyone jumped on the bed, there were 15 mm -hmm. people on a bed watching yep. the show or uh, cartoons or whatever movie he had to show. You never saw, you never heard anything in the course of a 25-year relationship that made you think that Michael Jackson was a pedophile? No. Nothing. No, nothing. I absolutely mm -hmm. feel I would have seen something over the years, but not a thing. Not guilty. A dramatic victory for Michael Jackson. And after a three and a half month trial, Jackson was acquitted, though the taint of the accusation continued to linger. Tonight, for the first time, his friends reveal how devastating the trial was for him. They were there at Neverland every morning getting him ready. Faye says the routine was always the same, beginning at 3 a.m. Before I washed his hair, we actually knelt down on the ground. And he put his arms around me, and I put my arms around him, and he would put his head right here and weep. And we would pray for God to help us and, and for people to know the truth. And then we'd get up and wipe our tears, and I would wash his hair. Do you think he thought he was going to be convicted, Karen? He didn't know. I mean, it was so vicious. I had to walk the red carpet into that courtroom every day in front of all the cameras. And every day for that long walk, he had a new outfit designed by his old pals, delivered every morning at 6 a.m., a boost for his morale. And after you got him dressed, it was like, we love you. No, I love you more. When we come back, new intimate details from his final weeks from those who were at his side. Did you think that he was vulnerable enough that he might die? Yes. 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 Art, Michael Jackson played repeatedly with the idea of metamorphosis, from thriller to black or white, to ghosts, where he becomes a middle-aged white guy. And looking back, it seems as if Michael Jackson viewed his own face as yet another canvas, another opportunity to explore change. For the first time tonight, we talked to the woman who knew his face almost as well as he did, Karen Fay, 
his makeup artist for more than 25 years. Uh, of course, stage makeup is one thing, but mm -hmm. makeup on men in life is, is looked at as very peculiar, especially mm -hmm. like, during the trial when he's wearing eyeliner and what appears to be lipstick. It's, it's very sensitive for me to even talk about because these, these are things that are very, very private. He didn't like the line that was drawn between what's allowed for men and what's allowed for women. He really was very androgynous in the sense that he just took whatever is available to enhance himself as art. So in some ways, people have said that he saw himself as an artistic canvas. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's the explanation That's nice also for yeah. the plastic surgery. He was always trying to perfect everything. Plastic surgeons have looked at his face and said, that the nose actually became almost non-functioning because of the repeated plastic surgery. That's not surgeries. true. That's not true. He didn't no, have to wear no. a nose prosthesis. No, <laughs> absolutely well, not. A lot of people believe no. it. So oh, let's, let's straighten you know what it was. It was the tape that he used to wear on his nose, and everybody thought that was why tape. Because um, I guess after plastic surgery, it keeps keeps it in form, or else it would expand. Because a lot of people think he went too far. You never said to him, Michael... I thought he was beautiful, and I would always tell him I thought he was beautiful. Personally, I think it went a little too far, but, like, I never, ever, um... because I understood it. Faye says she saw Jackson announce his new tour on television on March 5th of last year. and soon got a call from him asking if she'd team up with him once again for their fourth tour together. From the time you first talked to him about going back to work in March mm -hmm. to May, you, did you see a change? Yes. Tell me about it. I think he was frightened. Of? Being judged again. He said during the trial, I can't believe the world is doing this to me. He said, I, I gave everything that I had. I gave them my music, I danced for them, and this is what I get in return. And not since the trial, she says, had she seen such fear in Jackson's eyes. And when it really got down to standing up in front of an audience, all that fear, all that doubt, all that cruelty that people directed at him, he was afraid. To, he didn't want to go through that again. When you looked at Michael Jackson's face at the end, it looked sad. He was very sad. He was starting to lose weight. Oh, he, he wasn't sleeping. And he was losing weight drastically. The week before he died, probably about 15 pounds, I would say. And he didn't have 15 pounds to lose. No, no. In fact, when I met him in March, one of my very first <clears throat> concerns was that I thought he was too thin to really be able to do a show. But, you know, I thought, oh, plenty of time. Once he starts working out, getting on the dance floor, he's going to eat, he's going to build himself up again. But I did tell Kenny Ortega, I said, Kenny, we really have to get some weight on him. The director. director of choreography. And that, that was the main concern. So there was a lot of pressure going into this. A lot of pressure. This was going to be his first major appearance since the trial. A the lot more shows than he wanted or agreed to do. And the first time his kids were going to see it. Yes. Mm. So there was a lot on the line. And Jackson wanted to top himself. Better dancing, better costumes, even the 3D movie is part of the show. Did you also feel that he was taking drugs at that time? Medication of some sort? I really don't, can't really go here because of impending trial and things like that so we can't this is kind of like a difficult area well were you concerned about him on I was extremely concerned with Michael's well-being I was very concerned with his well-being you'd seen him in dicey situations before were you more concerned than you'd ever absolutely been? a lot more concerned he was like bone thin and he grabbed me on the arm and say you promised me you wouldn't tell tell what what I'm seeing mm -hmm. did you tell anybody Absolutely. What did you say? I was talking to the people who had the power to do something about it. What were your fears? I feared that Michael was physically unable to do the shows in his condition. Did you think that he was vulnerable enough that he might die? Yes. 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 
there was just these telltale signs. When is someone going to pay attention? Because it, to me, it was blatant. What was blatant? The way he was, like, on stage pre rehearsing. Um, what was different about it? A lot of start-stops. Usually when we did a music video with Michael, they'd load the camera full of film, they would run it until it ran out. You didn't do two bars of the song and stop. That was Michael's energy. He fed off of what was going on. He didn't have his usual stamina. No, and then you start speaking up, like she said, to the powers that be, and it just seemed like it was falling on deaf ears, or we'll fix that later, or there's more, something else that seemed like it was more important. Because when you see the video that was put out of the rehearsal of the This Is It concert, it sure looks like Michael Jackson's on top of the world. Okay. It's great editing. It isn't the reality that we're seeing. He Absolutely wasn't. not. If, even if you look at the songs, um, the way they're edited, he has three different outfits on for one song. In, in most, they were taken bits and pieces from different rehearsal dates to be able to put it together to make it look like he got through a song. But he, we really didn't get through a whole song. Um, I think maybe, I think we got through two ballads all together. And sure enough, here in the number Smooth Criminal, five outfits for the same song. But ABC News spoke to three of Jackson's dancers, who in the final rehearsal before he died, say Jackson was going all out. And that they were shocked by his death. As for his weight loss, the concert's producers, AEG, say they too were concerned and hired someone to monitor his eating. But Faye and Bush still insist Jackson was nowhere near ready. <clears throat> I didn't think he could do a show. And this was not the Michael Jackson that you would work with for 25 years? No. He didn't have mm -hmm. the control that he was used to having. On the 25th of June last year, Karen Faye was waiting for Jackson at the Staples Center to begin rehearsals when she got the call she dreaded. Michael Jackson had been rushed to the hospital. Michael Jackson was brought here in full cardiac arrest. And is now in a coma at the UCLA. When did you find out? <sighs> Kenny kind of instructed us to keep going and rehearsing and getting ready. Do what we're supposed to do. We're not sure what's going on right now. Let's just carry on as usual. I was headed back to my room, my makeup room, and uh, Kenny came out of his office. And he put his arms around me and held me up and whispered in my ear, he's gone, we lost him. And my knees just collapsed. Do you think Michael Jackson needed to die? Do you think that was inevitable or could he have been saved? I think if people paid attention, we'd still have him. <laughs>